measuring social outcomes uh, and the sentiment of communities in which they live um, is an increasingly important activity. Um, but as the title of this uh, session sort of demonstrates, um, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do and, and definitely not, we're not actually there uh, in yet. In the time I have with you this afternoon, uh, I'd like to do three things. Uh, first, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the local government in Queensland and of my association, the LJQ. Um, as the peak body for Queensland councils, we play a pretty interesting and important role in helping councils to better serve their communities. Uh, secondly, I'd like to introduce you to a recently released, uh, released uh, piece of work that we've done called the Community Wellbeing Indicators Project. But I'll give you some more uh, background on that particular project. And then to finish this afternoon, uh, I'll take you through the actual survey tool that we used, uh, what the inaugural survey findings actually were, and then uh, what the next steps will be. In short, uh, by the time we finish this afternoon, you should have a good understanding of local government in Queensland and how we're approaching the question of measuring social Let's outcomes. Let's actually start by talking about Queensland. Queensland's big. 1.8 million square kilometres and home to over 4.5 million Queenslanders. Unlike the case in some other parts of Australia, I can tell you that every square centimetre of Queensland is controlled by a local council. Point being here that local government is everywhere in Queensland. Perhaps not surprisingly, our biggest council, Brisbane City, yeah, very excited response there from the audience. So yeah, Brisbane City, <laughs> near on a million residents uh, live in the greater Brisbane area. Um, what about the smallest council in Queensland? There's a little place called uh, Mapoon, right up the very top of Cape York, home to only 214 residents. In terms of geographical size, our largest shire in Queensland is the Cook Shire, again up on Cape York. It's 106,000 square kilometres in size, which by comparison is bigger than Tasmania by 10%. Now, these statistics generally are pretty boring, uh, but when you consider that each of these uh, council areas are home to local communities, the complexity of trying to determine what makes for good social outcomes becomes more challenging. Look, sure, Queensland is home to some very large urban populations, think Cairns, Brisbane, Mackay, Emerald, Toowoomba, but it's also home to some very small and some incredibly remote communities. Think Birdsville, Bullia, Burketown, or our Indigenous communities like on Mornington Island or up in the Torres Strait. There are also Strait. 17 councils in Queensland where the resident population uh, has a Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander uh, heritage uh, which is more than the other population, so they are the majority in 17 councils. But it is this diversity that makes our state great and also reflects the challenges that all governments of all levels have in making sure that residents have access to relevant services and appropriate support. Who wants to yell out what this is a photo of? Athens Olympics, who put your hand up, who said that? Very well done, front and centre, see, that's where the smart people sit. <laughs> Learned that from school. The very first uh, Athens Olympics, uh, way back in 1896. Now the relevance of this photograph is that 1896 is exactly the same year that my association, the LJQ, was established here in Queensland. So for 117 years, we've been representing, supporting and helping Queensland councils. This longevity means that we've been around long enough to see how Queensland has changed. And we know for a fact that community profiles have also changed over that time. Myself, I've been with the LJQ for over 10 years. And as part of my job, I get to travel quite extensively. I've visited every one of those 73 councils, uh, many of them more than once. I've seen firsthand how communities have changed as a consequence of the mining boom, and more recently, the arrival of the significant coal seam gas exploration and investment. I've also seen firsthand how communities have changed following the terrible destruction from the cyclones and floods. And I've just come back from a trip to Western Queensland, where I've seen the impact the drought is having on those communities, and also the lingering effect of the livestock exports. Queensland is a land of contrasts. Boom and bust, drought and flooding rains, growth and in some towns sadly decline. Like QCOS, uh, the LJQ is many things to many different people. We offer a smorgasbord of activities and solutions, yet we try to ensure that whatever we do has application to both big and small councils alike. For the purposes of today, the best way to explain who we are and what we do is simply to say that we are an organisation owned by Queensland councils and run by Queensland councils. My president, a lady by the name of Councillor Margaret DeWitt, is a councillor from right here in Brisbane in the western suburbs. We have a 15-member executive committee, which is made up of mayors and councils from across the state, from communities as diverse as Longreach, Gympie, Palm Island, Mackay, Cairns, Thursday Island, just to name. Having these individuals who have been elected to represent these such diverse communities is a great thing for our boardroom. 
It means that whenever we have debates, uh, local views of those local communities are being able to be put forward. Our mission strongly. is a really simple one, and that is to improve the ability and performance of local government to better serve their community. We achieve this in three main ways, uh, through advocacy, daily support, and provision of Just services. quickly, in terms of advocacy, we are the unified voice for local government. Our advocacy efforts take us regularly to George Street and to Canberra, where we seek to influence policymakers. Try and stop bad policy from becoming law, and we try and make good laws even better. We appear at numerous parliamentary hearings, we make countless submissions, a bit like QCOS, and importantly, we undertake research to help inform our policymakers. The Community Wellbeing Indicators Project, which I'll come to shortly, is a good practical example of one of our more recent advocacy initiatives. It may also surprise you to learn that the LJQ is the most talked about peak body in our state parliament. It is mentioned more times in Hansard than any other organisation. But like any other good advocacy body, uh, not all of those mentions are in a positive light. Uh, we provide support on a daily basis to those working in and leading local government uh, and remain available to take questions, provide advice and assist with any matters that are causing concern or difficulty. Provide regular updates and alerts. We publish resources and manuals covering all manner of things that councils get involved with and we make available a range of practical tools. We also have several staff employed in our organisation uh, that have particular social policy backgrounds and community engagement experience. And just quickly to finish off who we are, uh, we also provide services on the ground to councils. We regularly travel to different parts of the state to assist councils with operational matters. We are a recognised training organisation as well as an industrial relations advocate. We own several businesses that support councils in areas such as purchasing, information technology and insurance, just to name but a few. Now this background about my organisation I hope effectively sets the scene for this conversation about measuring social outcomes. For us, the need to understand community sentiment is in itself an important thing uh, in regards to local decision making. Having some tools and a methodology to help councils quantify social outcomes is a useful thing to have. But in itself, decision making within local government contexts is often much more involved and indeed personal. Queensland's 559 mayors and councillors have many deep community connections, and they're never usually far away from local community organisations and events, particularly if there's a free cup of tea and a scone to be, uh, to be offered. Uh, that gives them a very easy first-hand perspective of what community sentiment now, is As I like. mentioned in my preamble, we've recently released our findings from our inaugural Community Wellbeing Indicators project. Uh, this project's been several years in the making and was aimed at supporting councils to develop ways to better understand and measure local community wellbeing. We were interested in finding out how to build a consistent statistics base, which in turn could help improve community planning and by extension also strengthen resident involvement in the planning processes. Now, as some further background, we undertook a community wellbeing indicator pilot survey back in 2011 to trial a limited set of wellbeing indicators. Um, and those community indicators, wellbeing indicators, were based on community perceptions and we're seeking to demonstrate the value that such an approach might have to local government. At that time, we secured five councils across the state to help with our pilot project. They were the Sunshine Coast, Gladstone, Isaac, based on Moorumbah, and Longreach, where we conducted a telephone survey with residents in that area. We also replicated the survey at Woodjul Woodjul, uh, an Aboriginal community, uh, where we used a, a, a group forum to bring together community members to respond to the question. This questionnaire. project was jointly sponsored by the LJQ and the Australian Centre for Excellence in Local Government and it built on work undertaken nationally in developing community wellbeing indicators. All up, this has contributed to the enhanced capacity of Queensland councils to plan for, measure, and report on the wellbeing of their communities. A key objective of the project was to formulate a valid set of indicators which provide a general indication of community wellbeing in a particular local government area. It was also important for us to find a tool that could be benchmarked against others in other council areas. Now, at this point, it's probably, again, just important to emphasise that our project does not seek to identify every possible measure of community wellbeing. Instead, we were aiming to develop a practical community survey tool that could be used to assess and monitor community wellbeing within the framework of local community objectives and the context of local government's own roles and responsibilities. So what exactly are the attributes that we concluded were, for local government's purposes, make up community wellbeing? Well, as uh, we talked about earlier, up until recently, the Local Government Act, which is the primary piece of legislation that defines how councils operate in Queensland, required all councils to prepare and publish a community plan. A uh, this plan. exercise required councils to take a serious look at their community planning processes and their community engagement practices. 
Now, even though legislation has changed recently to take that obligation away, most of our councils, in fact, nearly all of our councils are still keenly interested the in this. The interrelationship between community wellbeing, economic development, ecological sustainability, the built environment, social equality and justice have long been recognised as integral to the role of local government. To our reading, there's been a resurgent global interest in these interrelationships, and we can point to work taken by our colleagues over here and work by the OECD and indeed our own ABS in that regard. In short, the concept of community wellbeing has been the focus of research for many years, but this has somewhat been revitalised with a renewed interest in how it might be measured. At the LJQ, we've had several attempts at this problem. Uh, back in 2001, we released a guideline to including uh, community wellbeing in planning schemes. Uh, that specifically focused on statutory planning impacts and relationship with community wellbeing. A few years after that, we launched our Local Government and Social Capital Action Research Project, which furthered the interest in community wellbeing by focusing on relevant practical steps that councils could take to enhance social capital, including the importance of collecting baseline and community these all data. pieces of work led up to our current Community Wellbeing Indicators we've Project. We've sought to enhance councils' ability to measure the value of their investment in their communities across social, cultural, economic, environmental and democratic activities. In developing our indicators, we were assisted by the work done in other jurisdictions and mentioned before about the work done in The Victoria. development and use of a standardised community survey tool in practical terms uh, provides a lot of value to us. We've provided, tried to provide a tool to councils that have allowed us to uh, measure community wellbeing uh, using a number of standard indicators, allows us to track changes over time in that community wellbeing, allows us to benchmark the performance of councils uh, across the state, and also allows us to identify some policy measures that might be able to help improve community outcomes. Our Queensland framework has five themes. The five themes are, first of all, healthy, safe and inclusive communities. Number two is culturally rich and vibrant communities. Number three is dynamic, resilient local economies. Number four is sustainable built and natural environments. Number five is democratic and engaged communities. The information that populates these five themes are collected using a pretty simple survey instrument, uh, 20 questions long, covering 34 indicators. Now, as can perhaps be expected, um, our survey instrument asks some quite simple nuts and bolts questions about particular interest to local government such as things like access to community infrastructure, like parks and sports and recreation facilities. But the tool also seeks feedback on broader social issues, such as the suitability of community for people like seniors, children and now, teenagers. Because there's only 20-odd questions, and it's the last session of the afternoon, as a little bit of a group participation exercise, I thought we could quickly run through the 20 questions with you. This is going to be an unofficial attempt at this survey, uh, but hopefully this uh, crowdsourced approach might end up with some interesting little bits of information. And also, too, the practical aspect of going through the survey uh, might give you a bit of a feel for the tone of the survey and what we try to develop. We won't have time to go into each question in detail. We'll go through them pretty quickly. Um, but for some of the questions, I'm actually going to get you to raise your hand to, uh, to score the particular question. It's a really simple exercise. Uh, when I ask you to, I'll get you to raise your hand with a score out of one of five. If you fully support the argument or the point that I'm trying to make, it's a score of five, and you can raise your hand up with five fingers on it. If you disagree, uh, you put one finger up. So we get to see fives or threes or twos uh, across the room. Now, before we actually get into the 20 questions themselves, just with a quick show of hands, who here does not live in South East Queensland? Wow, that's excellent. All right, so we have a good geographical spread across the state. Statistically uh, relevant, I hope, Professor. Um, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how we go. So the first question is really easy. I'll get you to raise your hand. All right, uh, public transport. So using the fingers on your hand and thinking about the place in which you live, how would you rate the adequacy of public transport in your community in terms of your needs and well-being? So five if you think it's a perfect fit, one if you think it's, uh, it's not. So show of hands. Ooh, split, split, twos, fives, ones. Someone's got zero up the back. There is no zero, but uh, all right, hands down. Very good. Interesting. Difficult average, that one, to sort of get. Um, the next one, hopefully, a little bit easier. Uh, so again, thinking about the place where you live, how would you rate the advocacy of the health services in your community in regards to your needs and well-being? So again, hands up, out of five. What have we got? Fives, fives, fives. So health's a bit stronger. That's interesting. All right, hands down, well done. I hope you're enjoying the exercise. All right. uh, the third one, uh, not unsurprisingly, education. So how would you rate the adequacy of education services in your community in regards to your needs and well-being? So hands up, education. Two, 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 
Fives and twos, so maybe you split there between uh, where people live. All right, keep your hands down for a while. Um, You're doing so well. the next two areas are reasonably quite straightforward. Uh, let's have a look at uh, the next one. Uh, sport and recreation, okay? Again, relevant to, uh, to Queensland councils. And after that, um, involvement in arts and culture. So the first five areas are pretty straightforward. A useful guide to the major services that you'd normally expect to see within a community. And you know, areas that can, uh, community members will have a very strong view on, as have already been demonstrated here this afternoon. Um, the next part of the survey takes a bit more of a local government uh, deep dive. So again, hands down, no need to vote on this. But how do you rate the parks in your community for their level of upkeep? And similarly, how would you rate the parks in your community for accessibility? Similarly, moving on, a local government theme, how would you rate the availability of community um, bikeways? How would you rate the availability of footpaths? And, walking and finally, paths. to finish the local government section, a uh, good question about the environment. How satisfied would you be with the efforts being made in your community to protect and conserve the natural environment? And the flip side of that question, how satisfied are you with the efforts being made in your community to provide a livable built environment? Now, the next question will go back to some crowdsourced data. This will be a very interesting one considering the geographical uh, spread we have in this room. Uh, and also, too, because you all work in the social services sector, it'll be interesting to see how you rate uh, these particular questions. So the first one is, again, with the show of hands, how would you rate the suitability of your community, where you live, for young children? Out of five. Go and be brave. Fives, threes, ones, twos. Hmm, interesting. The statewide average on our survey was 3.5. Second question, how would you rate the suitability of the community for teenagers? So again, show of hands, be brave. Ones, lots of ones. Threes, twos, yep. Uh, not unsurprisingly, it was a bit of a lower score at 2.97 out finally, of five. Finally, how would you rate the suitability of your community for seniors? Oh, a bit up. stronger, that looks like, yep. Uh, and again, that reflects our statewide survey results where it was uh, closer to three and a half. What was interesting about that particular set of questions was that the suitability of uh, the community for teenagers polled lower than those other two categories for young children and for, uh, for seniors. Now, the next set of questions I won't ask to put your hands up for because they're a little bit more personal. Okay, but it asks about what level of support uh, you get from your friends, what level of support you get from your family, and what level of support you get from your neighbours. And then in similar sorts of themes, uh, how would you rate access to buildings and services in your community for people with a disability? Respondents to look at, how would they rate the racial harmony within their community? Um, for us, we found the results quite encouraging. Now, Queenslanders that completed the survey reported that their communities were very quite harmonious, which was a, a good outcome. And uh, I think the QCOS survey picked up this next one, which is about volunteering. And it talks about how would you rate the level of involvement in your community as a volunteer or a member of the community organisation. Again, uh, it was a very low score, reflecting the QCOS uh, results. Halfway through, almost finished. Moving on. Uh, again, you can think about these answers in your head. How safe do you feel when you're outside and alone in a public space in your community? Uh, thinking about your personal life and your personal circumstances, how satisfied are you are you with your life as a whole? Uh, again, like in QCOS, we ask a few questions about employment, okay? Uh, and this one here is a little bit different. Uh, we ask people to either agree or disagree with these statements, the fact that their work is not too demanding or stressful. Work and family life did not interfere with each other. And I have good job security. Um, the next obvious questions about employment obviously bring us to these ones. How would you rate the impact on your household from the increasing cost of living? And how would you rate the impact on your household's finances regarding your current rental or mortgage payments. And then in finishing off the survey, um, how satisfactory is the way that your local council provides opportunities for your voice to be heard on issues that are important? How would you rate the overall performance of your local council in delivering an appropriate range and quality of services relevant to your household the classic needs? perennial internet question. How satisfactory is your ability to access the internet whenever you need? And the last one, how satisfactory is your ability to access private or public transport to meet your daily mobility requirements? So again, by our five themes, we put up just the consolidated response across all those particular areas. Our original pilot back in 2001 and the most recent survey done just a few weeks ago uh, across the top four indicators has been a strengthening uh, in terms of the uh, or mostly first three and then a bit of a weakening in the last, uh, last two. So looking at the detailed statewide results of our survey, there were three areas where there was a marked change in results between our original pilot and the 2013 survey. The three areas were the adequacy of public transport, that very first question. Um, surprisingly, it slipped quite significantly from an original score of 3.9, almost four, uh, all the way down to 2.75. Uh, it's probably interesting to hypothesise why that might have been the case. Uh, what was the driver for that particular slippage? Uh, maybe it has something to do with the recent um, quite significant price increases in public transport. Uh, may have been one of those factors. 
The second area that changed quite significantly across the two surveys um, was the suitability of community for teenagers. I mentioned this before. Um, it slipped from 3.4 in the first survey down to 2.97. Not a massive decline, but statistically significant uh, all the same. And the last one, as we had the Grona, was job security. Uh, perhaps not unsurprisingly, uh, originally when we did the survey back in 2011, that uh, was 3.8, fell all the way down to 3. Uh, blame the end of the mining boom and perhaps the reforms to the public service for some of that. Uh, from a regional perspective, there were also some interesting stories to be told. Uh, by far the strongest measure in the survey related to life satisfaction and support from family members. Queenslanders by and large seem to be pretty happy people and family connections amongst them seem to be strong. What was interesting though was that those who lived in provincial centres reported that they were happier and more connected to families than those of us who live here in southeast Queensland or indeed in rural areas. Cost of living was a major concern, not unsurprisingly, uh, but contrastingly, it was those in provincial cities that were more concerned by that issue than those in southeast Queensland or rural Queensland. So, interesting uh, flip in that respect. The weakest score overall, as I mentioned, was regarding uh, participation in volunteer organisations. And again, it was those in provincial cities that um, reported the lowest scores in that regard. Now, for those who are interested in the full results of our particular indicators, you can find them on our website at www.ljq.asn.au. Now, again, just emphasising, it wasn't our intention to map every single exhaustive uh, community wellbeing indicator, but from the work completed we have done to date, it appears to be quite a useful and practical tool helping us to get a better understanding of what community sentiment is. This understanding, we hope, will lead to uh, better local decision making and much more thoughtful policy. We've only just recently made this research available and the survey tool has also been released to councils just recently. We're hoping that we're able to repeat this exercise um, with some larger sample sizes over the next 18 months. And there's also the further prospect that we might be able to complete a deeper dive into some of the community sentiment indicators with some specific regions in Queensland. We're currently in the early stages of conversations with some councils about how that might be achieved. Now to conclude today, uh, I hope I've been able to show you this afternoon that our approach to uh, how we've done our approach to local government in regards to community wellbeing indicators. Certainly a quite an interesting set of data and like any good survey tools and as QCOS uh, talked about, I'm sure it'll raise much more questions than it does answer.